Let us pray. Most holy and gracious God, we come once again to study your word, asking as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to continue to look at the amazing view of the Father's love for mankind and answer the question, why? Why was it all necessary? Why did Jesus have to die on, for our sin? We're going to pick up where we left off last time to answer that question. Romans, the third chapter, verses 25 and 26. And this is the NIV. It says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice for at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So I'll start the lesson with a disclaimer. The fact that we have made it to this verse the Thursday before Resurrection Sunday is totally an act of the Holy Spirit. I cannot take credit. When I started the lesson and realized where it would go and realized that the it was a Thursday before the resurrection Sunday. I was like, wow, God, you are awesome. But here we are to answer the question, why did Jesus have to die on the cross for our sin? So let's dissect those verses. Paul says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. So God presented Jesus as an atone, as a sacrifice of atonement. This describes the work of God in Christ Jesus by which the sinner is reconciled to God. To get a proper picture of atonement, it, it must be looked at in terms of the Old Testament teachings and practices. You remember under the Mosaic Law, atonement for sin was achieved by the death of a sacrificial animal. The shedding of, of, of his blood was evidence of his death. <coughs> In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the need of reconciliation is presented by the resolve of God <clears throat> to satisfy his holiness and justice. Man in, in, in his sin is unfit for fellowship and eternity with God. Man cannot forgive his own guilt, nor can he free himself from sin. The Old Testament sacrifices were never designed as a means of human self-atonement. They only pointed to the atonement of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> His blood covers our sin, and we are made right with God when we believe in what Jesus has done. So it would seem that we have have the answer to our question. Why did Jesus have to die? But don't be so quick on your assumption. That only tells us what Jesus did and why he did it. It doesn't tell us why Jesus had to die. Let's look at the next part of verse 25. It says, 
He did this to demonstrate his justice. God offered his son as a sacrifice to demonstrate his justice. Let that sink in for a minute. God presented his son as a sacrifice to demonstrate, to prove, to show his justice. That's major. So major, I'll say it again. God allowed his only begotten son to die a humiliating death, a humiliating public death on the cross to prove, to confirm, to show the world his justice, to show his righteousness. Why would God do such a thing? Well, let's look at the next part of the verse. It says, because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Y'all, this is major. This is big. This is huge. It is so big that just studying the lesson, I almost exploded. It, it, it was it was hard even typing. I was like trying to type and trying to think and and, and, and wanting somebody to just hold my mule while I shouted. Remember God, we said that God is a just God. That's the key to this whole thing. God is pure. His justice is pure. His righteousness is pure. God is by nature just. When you have pure justice, that means that where there is sin, when somebody messes up, some, when somebody falls short, as we all have, as we all do, in a system of pure justice, nobody gets off the hook. Somebody has to pay. Pure justice doesn't just let people go. It doesn't. Pure justice does not just let people off the hook. We're living in a world where it seems that our justice system let people off the hook all the time. We've seen it done so many times that we've grown cold to it. In fact, depending on who you are, we expect it. But where there is pure justice, somebody has to pay. God is pure and he is just. The verse says, in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Forbearance means mercy. <clears throat> so in his mercy, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Note that it does not say he let folk off the hook. Throughout the Old Testament, starting with Adam and Eve, God sent message after message that death would be the punishment for sin. And yet, nothing happened. He never wiped everybody out. In fact, it got so bad that Isaiah asked the question, who has believed our report? Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because nobody believed him. Ezekiel was commissioned by God as a watchman and warned to tell those wicked people that they would die. And on and on, God sent messengers. He sent messages that where there is sin, there must be death. And yet nobody died, more times than not. The people acted as though God was not going to do anything. It seemed as though there was just no justice. Here's the next part of that verse. God is not only just, but he's also merciful. So to be pure justice, and at the same time, merciful seems like a contradiction to us. 
it seems like there's a tension between pure justice and mercy. The, the dilemma with reconciliation, purely from a human viewpoint, was that of saving man in an act of perfect righteousness and judging man in an act of love. That's one of those, if you remember the phrase, Houston, we've got a problem. But that's not a problem for God. That's, that is a problem only in light of our human understanding. How could God bring his justice and his mercy together in such a way that justice was done to the righteousness of God on the one side and a full display of his love on the other side? to save guilty and helpless mankind. How could it be done? How, how could you display justice to a righteous God and, and then display love on the other hand? It, it's as though God is saying, I'm glad you asked. In his eternal wisdom and power, God had in himself from the beginning of time, the answer to that question, how he could be both justice and merciful, how he could show love and how he could show justice uh, or how he could show justice and how he could show love. He, he knew he had it in himself from the beginning of time. He knew the answer to the question. The answer lied in, in the person and work of Jesus Christ the incarnate son in whom all the demands of righteousness were met. In the life of Jesus, he kept the law perfectly in our place. And he gave his life under the penalty of the law for the sin we committed. In so doing, the purpose of absolute justice and love was accomplished. Mankind was freed from the guilt of sin and restored to the eternal fellowship of God. Verse 26 says, he, meaning God, did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so Jesus died because God is just. Only a perfect person could satisfy the law. And only Jesus was perfect. To demonstrate that he is a just God, sin could be overlooked for a while. But eventually the debt has to be paid. God sent his son in the New Testament present time to take care of our sin debt. Jesus was both God and man, which means that he could fully act on behalf of God and he could fully act on behalf of man and he could act for God and for man for one cause. So by sending his son, God now dealt with mankind only with one man, Jesus Christ, who is himself both God and man. God must be perfectly consistent with himself. He, he would not be God if he changed the law to accommodate the situation. God cannot break his own law or violate his own nature. God couldn't change the rules and say, well, uh, I'll just let it go. He, he couldn't change the rules. God is love. And in his love, he wants to forgive. Us. He wants to forgive sinners. But he is also a God of holiness. And in his holiness, 
he cannot just overlook it. He, he must punish sin and, up, and, and uphold his righteous law. So God, he, he, is, he is holy and God is also a God of grace and mercy. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Through Jesus Christ, God is both the both just and the justifier. In his mercy, he can overlook sin for a while, but in his justice, the debt has to be paid. Somebody has to pay. In his grace, he decided to allow his son to die for our sin. When Jesus died, he paid for our, all the sins ever committed, even as far back as Adam. And he also paid for all future sins that would be committed. On the cross, when Jesus said, it is finished, the law was fully satisfied. God's justice was fully satisfied and the price of sin, which is death, was fully satisfied. And so no one, especially Satan, could accuse God of being unjust or unfair because in his forbearance, in his mercy, he had allowed sin to go unpunished for a while. In his mercy, God allowed sin to go unpunished for a while. But in his justice, the debt had to be paid. Somebody had to pay the debt. And in his grace, he sent his son to bear the penalty for our sin. Finally, the last part of verse 26 says, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so we said that God is righteous by nature. He showed his righteousness by his forbearance. Remember, forbearance means mercy. In his patience and long suffering with mankind, God didn't destroy all flesh off the earth. Even with Noah, he saved the remnant. So God didn't destroy, he, he never destroyed all flesh off the earth because of his patience and his long suffering. The fact that God waited until Christ came, thousands of years, 42 generations, God waited. The fact that he did, the fact that God was forbearing, in holding back the punishment of sin shows that God is righteous. God's righteousness is seen in his justice. He accepted the death of Christ as a substitute for our sin. Then God's righteousness is seen in his being the justifier of all who believe. God takes our faith and what his son did and counts it as righteousness. He takes our faith and judges us acceptable to him. The fact that God accepted the death of Christ as the sacrifice for our sin and justifies us shows that God is a righteous and just God. In the 53rd chapter, verses 4 and 5, the King James Version said, <clears throat> Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
God through his son, Jesus Christ, has given us a free gift, free to us, but it cost him a tremendous price. He paid a debt that we all had incurred, but in no way could we pay. But in order to activate the gift, we must receive it through faith. Why? Because one day he's coming back. When Jesus comes back, it will not be in grace or mercy because he is just, he is coming back as the righteous judge. And everybody will have to give an account of the lives that we've all lived. If you've received the free gift of salvation, the blood of Jesus covers you. If you have not accepted the free gift, then you have to pay for your own sin, which is impossible to do. As we end our scenic route, looking at the amazing love the Father has for us, we'll close out by reading Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 17 through 21 the Living Bible Version. It says, And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep, and how high his love really is, and to experience his love for yourselves. Though it is so great, you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. And so at last, you will be filled up with God himself. Now, glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to act or even dream of infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. May he be given glory forever and ever through endless ages because of his master plan of salvation for the church through Jesus Christ.